Dr. Eve Salomon Fernandez is the president of, you all know this, I'm sure, because she's well known out here, uh, is the president of Greenfield Community College. Uh, she previously served as uh, president of C Cumberland County College in New Jersey and interim president of Mass Bay Community College in Wellesley. Dr. Salomon Fernandez has held research, management, and executive positions at private and public institutions as well as com uh, community colleges. She's also served as an adjunct professor at Boston College, Salem State University, and Cambridge College. And, and I think the, more, the most important things to mention about her uh, has to do with her, her very in, uh, career, her career and her dedication to these issues. Over the course of her career, she's distinguished herself as a visionary, innovative, and entrepreneurial executive committed to access and equity. Nationally, she has been recognized as a thought leader writing and speaking on a range of issues related to rural innovation, workforce development, women's leadership, and cross-sector partnerships. Eve recently finished a book chapter on rural innovation for new directions in community college published by Jossie Bass. In March 2018, she was named one of the top 25 women in higher education by diverse issues in higher education. She is also a past recipient of the Massachusetts Women Making History Now Award and the New Jersey Hispanic Leadership Award. And I want you to know she's also fluent in French in Spanish and uh, Haitian Creole. So uh, I assume you're gonna speak in English here today. <laughs> yes, but, all right. Please welcome, welcome our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. We can do better than that. All right. Um, I'm just really, really excited to be here. And Julie, we know each other. We used to work for Mayor Menino together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really exciting to be here to see um, East and West meet here in Western Mass. Uh, there are a few things that I've learned about Western Massachusetts is that we are very passionate about the human potential. And we lead with not only heart, but with courage to tackle really hard issues, issues like the Opioids Task Force. So I'm delighted to be the moderator today for both of our panels. Um, we have some extraordinary leaders, researchers, practitioners, and law enforcement folks um, who have deep expertise in this work and we will be sharing with us. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to let you know that you have index cards in your, on your chairs. And as the panelists are talking, if you have any questions, please be sure to note them. We will be collecting the cards. And once the panel is over, I will be reading some of the questions that you've asked. So we have multiple opportunities to engage with you today. We want to hear from you as well as our distinguished panelists. So I will now introduce them. Uh, first, we have Dr. Connie Horgan, and I want you to know that their full bios are available in your packet. I will simply read some excerpts so that you know who is speaking with us this morning. Dr. Horgan is a professor at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University and is the founding director of its Institute for Behavioral Health. She also leads the Brandeis Harvard Center for, to improve system performance of substance use disorder treatment funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Lastly, Dr. Horgan serves as a board member for the Massachusetts Health Policy Forum, the Massachusetts Health Council, and the Greater Boston Council on Alcoholism. She's also a standing member of the National Advisory Council on Alcohol Abuse and, Alcohol and Alcoholism. Welcome, Dr. Horgan. Also leading the panel, we have Mr. Robert Bowler, who is currently a PhD student at the Heller School for, Pub for Social Policy at Brandeis. And before coming to Brandeis, he worked in collegiate recovery and community-based efforts for substance use disorder. Dr. Bowler, is uh, research interests are in recovery science, opioid policies, and developing effective sub systems of care that address the continuum of care. I just awarded you your degree. <laughs> 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 
And also joining us today, we have Dr. Friedman, who is the Chief Research Officer and Endowed Chair for Clinical Research at Bay State Health. And he is also the Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Medicine and Quantitative Health Sciences. He is the current president of the Massachusetts Society of Addiction Medicine, and he was recently appointed to that position. And he also serves as a past president for the Association for Medical Education and Research in Substance Abuse, and he is the former director of the American Board of Addiction Medicine. Uh, he will serve as one of our respondents today. And lastly, our other respondent is Dr. Elizabeth Evans, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Promotion and Policy here at UMass Amherst. She serves as, uh, excuse me, she leads several state, federal, and foundation-funded projects that are designed to address the opioids crisis. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to the panel to share some of their insights with us, and we look forward to hearing from all of you. Dr. Horgan. Good morning, everyone. I know there's great human potential in this room, and thank you for, um, to Dr. Solomon Fernandez for uh, highlighting this, because that is something that has pervaded all our work in this project, and the excitement um, in Western Mass has been amazing. It's really good to be here, to be focusing on um, Western Mass. Our job in this panel is to focus on the research as background for what we hope will be a robust discussion, both with our uh, uh, responders here, but also um, with, the ad, uh, with the audience as well. We'll be talking about what are the unique challenges in Western Mass, but also the unique opportunities. You have the executive summary. You picked it up as you came in. There's a full issue brief that will be posted um, um, as this conference ends. It will be posted on the website today. But before I go on to the next slide, I would like to acknowledge our other co-author, um, who you will be hearing from later. Rob um, Bowler is the lead author on this report. Michael Doonan um, is also a co-author. Our, this slide, um, just we've heard a lot about our funders. You've been great. Thank you for being um, involved in this opioid issue, and thank you for showing your support for Western Massachusetts. Next. Um, the game plan uh, for today is we're going to give you a very brief overview um, um, of, the, um, of the issue brief. Um, my colleague, Robert Bowler, will be giving, doing most of the presentation. And um, the first three um, uh, bullets up there describe it. He will start out by talking about the extent of the opioid epidemic in Western Mass. First, will be a focus on the underlying epidemiology and then cost and consequences. We'll go right on to the unique challenges in Western Mass and then um, in, in a discussion about unique best practices and innovative programs in Western Mass. And then I will end um, with um, a set of recommendations that come out of our research. These are just what came out of our perception of from the research and in talking um, with you. Um, but we hope that there will be a robust, I keep saying robust discussion, between human potential and robust discussion. This is going to be a great, uh, um, <laughs> a great morning, uh, um, I think. The next um, slide um, describes our approach. We had a three-pronged um, approach. Um, we did an extensive literature review, not just of the academic literature, but also of what we call the gray literature reports that um, may be unpublished. We sort of dug deep. Um, I will say that in the full report, you will see there are 231 references um, uh, for this. So um, there really is an extensive background. We uh, secondly looked at publicly available data and then did secondary data analysis to drill down and get some data that's specific to Western Mass. And third, and I think this might be the most important uh, part of the report, and this is the um, 24 qualitative interviews that we did with, um, with the key various types of stakeholders. This was so important because it allowed us to put a face on the numbers, a face on the literature. It brought a little passion in, um, into the numbers, and, um, um, it th and thank you to all who, um, who participated in being an interviewee. Providers, community coalitions, 
criminal justice system, government officials, and harm reduction specialists. Um, finally, I'd like to just say, to give you a little highlight, not to upstage um, um, uh, Rob, I, Dr. Bowler to be. I, 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 um, he is one of our star um, doctoral students, so hopefully there'll be a doctor that's not honorary um, in the not too distant uh, um, future. But um, the themes um, that we'll be focusing on is the importance of community le leadership, um, which is uh, amazing um, in Western Mass. The rehabilitative role of um, criminal justice system, you've already heard a little bit about it from the, the previous um, speakers. Um, the need to engage more people in medication for opioid use disorders. Uh, we've heard a little bit uh, from Dr. Kerouac about things that are happening. And um, finally, the need for expansion of both harm reduction and recovery support services. Now, I would like to turn the microphone over to um, Doctor to be Bowler. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Horgan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we're going to start uh, looking uh, at the problem from an epidemiological perspective. And basically what that means is we're going to look at the distribution of opioid overdose deaths, of opioid use disorder, and opioid prescribing in the state and also in Western Mass. Next. Next slide, please. Uh, so many people in this room uh, probably, probably are very aware of the three waves of overdose deaths in the opioid epidemic. Uh, so first we had the prescription opioid uh, uh, deaths were really driving deaths. And then in 2010, you had the emergence of heroin deaths and the increase there. And then in 2013, you had the emergence of fentanyl and fentanyl derivatives. And Massachusetts has always had a slightly higher death rate than the national average. But you can see here in the brackets that in 2013, this difference really increased. And so what this is suggesting is that Massachusetts has been disproportionately affected by the emergence of fentanyl. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so opioid overdose deaths are, have been increasing in Western Mass, and we've already talked about this earlier. In 2017, all four counties saw a decrease, uh, and it was below the uh, state average death rate. But in 2018, all of the counties either matched or set a record high in opioid overdose deaths. Taken collectively, we had a 73% increase from the previous year. This is significant, and it's concerning. Next slide, please. Uh, and so we asked the question, well, why is this happening? And, and we really think that a significant factor here has been the recent increase uh, in the presence of fentanyl in the illicit drug supply. So historically, uh, Western Mass has had a lower presence of fentanyl, but you can see that over time that this is actually converging. So this difference is getting smaller. Uh, and in other words, what that means is that what happened a couple of years ago in the eastern part of the state with the dramatic increase of fentanyl uh, may be becoming a rea reality here in Western Mass. And this schematic here on the right just shows what a fatal dose of heroin versus fentanyl looks like. So it's just a few milligrams. And if you can imagine this being put in an illicit drug supply, if, uh, if you have a heterogeneous mixture of these few milligrams, then it's very likely that the, the, the drug user doesn't know what they're getting in each bag. Next slide. So looking specifically at opioid use disorder prevalence, uh, opioid addiction, uh, there are several counties in Western Mass that have much higher levels uh, compared to the rest of the state. Particularly Berkshire County has the highest opioid use disorder prevalence. Uh, one in 18 people over the age of 11 uh, are estimated to have an opioid use disorder. In Hamden County, that number is one in 20. Uh, and even in the lowest percentage county, Hampshire County, that number still represents one in every 29 people. So what we're looking at is a large proportion of the population that is susceptible uh, to an overdose. Next slide. And opioid prescribing is also higher in Western Mass, um, both measured by the percentage of the population that is receiving a prescription opioid, but also in the number of dosage units per capita. 
Also, historically, we know that opioid prescribing has been high in Western Mass. Uh, there was actually a recently released DEA database uh, that was covered very well by the Washington Post uh, that revealed this. Next slide, please. So with the opioid prescribing, we're seeing that a lot of people are being exposed to opioids. Uh, and it's very important to identify high-risk groups. And uh, these were identified by both the interview process and also the Chapter 55 report, which many people may be familiar with, but it was a legislatively mandated report that provided an assessment of opioid-related statistics in Massachusetts from 2011 to 2015. Uh, so it's very important to identify these groups so that we can tailor interventions at these high-risk populations. Next slide, please. So next we'll look at the problem from a cost and consequences perspective. Next. So the Mass Taxpayers Report, uh, which was released last year, estimated the cost of the opioid crisis in Massachusetts uh, in 2017 to be $15.2 billion. Uh, most of these costs were wrapped up in productivity losses and also increased health care burden. If we were to extrapolate this number to Western Mass, which has about 12% of the state population, this economic impact would be about $1.8 billion. Of course, we're not able to account for variation, which we know is present, so that's a crude estimate. Next slide, please. And we know that different industries are disproportionately impacted. Uh, so we know that the construction, uh, construction and the agriculture industry uh, are, are greatly affected, and, and these are definitely prevalent in Western Mass. Next. And so we heard a lot in the interviews about this intergenerational impact of the opioid crisis. Um, so ne neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is where babies are born dependent on opioids, uh, the rates in Massachusetts are higher than the national average, but the rates in Western Mass are higher than the state average. Uh, we also uh, heard a lot about this increase in grandparents that are tasked with raising uh, grandchildren, and a lot of these grandparents are of prime working age. Um, also, the foster care system is experiencing a burden. There has been an increase in uh, parental drug use nationally um, for placements for children, and then specifically in Massachusetts, we've seen a 20% increase uh, in the foster care placements uh, over the last five years. And as we talked about before, we know that there is a considerable intersection between the criminal justice system and, the, and substance use disorder. And what was revealed uh, in some of the data that's collected by some of the jails in Western Mass is that this intersection may even be more prevalent in Western Mass. And we also know that opioid use disorder among the incarcerated population is on the rise. Next slide. Uh, so now we're going to switch gears and talk about some of the unique challenges in Western Mass. This is just sort of a, a brief overview, and, and we have a lot of information in the issue brief. Next slide. So many people are probably familiar with this map here. Uh, we have Western Mass, and it's made up of urban, suburban, and rural areas. It has the Connecticut River that bisects it. Uh, and we heard a lot about access to treatment issues. Uh, and, and this was compounded by limitations in transformation, uh, transportation and also rural isolation. We also heard about these methadone deserts that were present. And basically what that means is that it was unrealistic for a person to be able to travel to a methadone clinic because of distances. And that really wasn't a, uh, a realistic option for them. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. And we also heard a lot about upstream factors. Um, so, you know, there's still a discourse on whether uh, socioeconomic status has anything to do with the susceptibility of opioid use disorder, but we know that this group uh, is more prone to an opioid overdose because they're less likely to be able to access quality treatment, and also they're less likely to be able to sustain recovery for many complex factors. And then also we heard a lot about trauma in the interviews. Uh, and data that was collected in some of the institutions that we talked to showed a very high prevalence in the criminal justice system and also showed a very high prevalence in children uh, who had parents that had substance use disorder. And then also we heard a lot about housing, um, having affordable housing when someone leaves treatment, uh, having that opportunity when someone leaves uh, from being incarcerated. Uh, and we actually had one interviewer note that uh, if people that are leaving the, the, these 
previous environments do not have access to stable housing and to gainful employment, then they're destined to use again. Next slide, please. And we heard repeatedly about stigma uh, in the interviews, and this stigma was manifested in many different ways. Um, so the, the general public gets the message that opioid use disorder is a disease, and, and, and sometimes it doesn't resonate with them because it's not what they perceive uh, what their perception is of a disease. Uh, people in recovery, if they are out about their recovery or, or, or people know about it, are very stigmatized in the workplace. And, and I think we all know that there's these different pathways to recovery, and some people on one pathway of recovery uh, may look down on another pathway of recovery, so this actually uh, increases stigma within the recovery community. Um, medications for opioid use disorder, which have a strong evidence behind them, many people see them as just simply substituting one drug for another. Uh, and lastly, medical professionals, we still have a huge issue uh, with stigma in medical professionals. A state survey that, that RISE actually partially funded uh, last year looked at, looked at Massachusetts and they found that over half of family medicine doctors, internal medicine doctors, and ER doctors uh, thought that opioid use disorder was not a treatable condition. So this is over half of medical professionals. Next slide, please. Uh, and so then we're gonna move into some of the best practices and just some of the innovative models that we came across in Western Mass. And again, I'd like to, to turn you to the issue brief to get a full picture of this. Next slide, please. And we'll be talking about it throughout the continuum of care and also community collaboration is added as well. Next slide. So community collaboration is vital um, for a community and, and, and this can look like having different types of coalitions, whether they be prevention coalitions or addiction coalitions or co coalitions specific to opioids uh, and also having aligned leadership. And, and what this does is it, it, it reduces stigma in a community, it reduces silos, and it increases the implementation of evidence-based strategies. Uh, we were able to work with uh, representatives from all four of the addiction uh, task force uh, and coalitions uh, countywide, and, and they're doing remarkable and crucial work in this space. Next slide. Some of the best practices in prevention are utilization of a PDMP, um, using academic detailing towards medical professionals, uh, education on safe disposal, uh, safe storage and disposal um, for patients that are prescribed medications so that it decreases prescription opioid misuse. And also you wanna have a, a very strong presence of prevention coalitions. Uh, some of the examples that we ran across in Western Mass were, were the Young Adult Empowerment Collaborative, uh, which is really targeting ages 16 to 25 uh, to reduce misuse and also to identify and treat early opioid use disorder in this population. And it's funded by a grant, and I just want to point out that the strength of the prevention and addiction coalitions really made this a possibility in Western Mass and brought in this grant money. Uh, and then also the Franklin Family Drug Court, which is uh, the first of its kind in the nation to have this model, really aims to address this intergenerational impact of the opioid crisis. Next. And so early intervention, we talked about the high-risk populations earlier. So models aimed at this high-risk population are very important, and also integrating addiction services into primary care, making it more accessible to a larger population. So two of the models that we highlight in the issue brief are the DART program, uh, which is a post-overdose response program uh, that's comprised of a team of police officers, harm reductionists, uh, and recovery coaching. And, and they, they're very innovative in that you know, it's a bonus if they can get the person linked to treatment, but they, they, they're framed under a harm reduction approach. So it's non-judgmental, it's compassionate, and they're there to meet people where they're at. And then also the Empower program through Bay State Franklin, which identifies and supports mothers uh, with opioid use disorder, uh, both during pregnancy and after pregnancy. Next slide. 
And then treatment, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about treatment uh, d uh, during the morning. There's a ton of evidence for medications for opioid use disorder, especially related to mortality. Uh, so it's very important to try to identify these touch points or, or places where we can increase people's engagement on these medications. Some of those promising uh, touch points that are emerging are prisons and jails, uh, emergency departments, uh, community health centers. Uh, and then also it's very important that someone, if, if it's warranted that someone needs long-term treatment, they should have that option. And, and, the, and the levels of care that they go through, should, should, they should experience a smooth transition. Um, the two of the innovative models that we highlight uh, are the Franklin County House of Corrections, uh, which uh, has been providing buprenorphine since 2016. They also have an intensive treatment program behind the walls for eligible uh, participants um, that, that and it's a voluntary participation. They actually refer uh, to, to the people that participate in these programs as clients rather than inmates. And then also the after incarceration support systems through the Hamden County Jail. This supports both uh, recently incarcerated individuals like Senator Markey talked about, which is a, a lot higher risk group, and then also supports sectioned patients uh, that are leaving the program. Uh, and it provides a comprehensive support services uh, to, to, to increase the chances of having a successful outcomes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And then recovery. Uh, so we want all pathways of recovery to be supported. Um, it's very important to have the presence of recovery community organizations, which are known in Massachusetts as recovery support centers. And it's very important to have recovery support services. And so what these may be are uh, targeted towards employment, um, recovery coaching, uh, education. Uh, these are all important areas uh, so that you can allow uh, facilitate the process of someone trying to rebuild their lives um, who, who have opioid use disorder. Uh, and there are eight recovery support centers in Western Mass. Actually, two are, are newly established. A lot of them uh, employ people uh, that have lived experience. And they're able to sort of take all of these recovery support services and put them under one roof. And if they're not there, they're able to connect their clients uh, to, to get what they need to address these social determinants of health. Next slide, please. And then uh, finally, harm reduction. Uh, so there is a ton of evidence for harm reduction as well, uh, yet uh, ideologies still serve as a huge barrier to having these services. So we know that syringe service programs, targeted naloxone distribution, um, being able to educate a person on safe injection practices and providing overdose response and, and, and awareness, these things work and they're very, very important. Um, uh, yet sometimes ideologies can serve as barriers. Uh, and, and what we found in Western Mass uh, was uh, Tapestry, which is a comprehensive um, harm reduction services. They provide all of these services on the left. Uh, and they are present in all four counties in Western Mass. Uh, and then another very innovative model that we ran across was the harm reduction hedgehogs. And so this is a, uh, they basically have a peer-based outreach team um, that goes beyond the brick and mortar building and goes out and tries to reach uh, hard to reach um, high risk populations. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to, to Dr. Horgan to uh, finish with our recommendations. Thank you. Here we are, the top 10. This is just our take on the top 10. You may have different views. Let's hear about it when we get to the um, uh, discussion uh, part of the program. Um, I'll just get right into it so that we have enough time to, to um, um, hear you. Number one, um, and these are actually, it was hard to pick the order, so these are just 10 things that um, emerge. But increasing and improving the treatment workforce in two particular areas, um, trauma-informed care and the physiology of addiction. And by the workforce, I want to emphasize it's not just the specialty treatment workforce, it's anyone who comes in touch with an individual who has a substance use disorder. So, um, and there's a lot that needs to be done in this area and there are lots of things that are happening um, so that people are better able, or providers and clinicians are better, or anyone who comes in touch with individuals can help. Um, 
Two, we've heard a lot about the task forces and coalitions. Um, it has been amazing what's happening out here in Western Mass and the role that um, you've played in bringing people together. So um, it, it, that's just been so key and important um, to continue and strengthen. Um, three, we started out the talk talking a, a little bit about prescribing uh, practices. We know things are going in the right direction. We need to continue interventions that lead to cautious opioid prescribing. Four, increasing the capacity of medication for um, OUD. I still can't say MAUD, doesn't that sound sort of weird? But anyway, um, that's what we're sometimes known as MAT. And to also increase the initiation of medications at vital touch points. Um, we've heard about the touch point of the criminal justice system. So being creative about the um, initiation points. Um, five, um, perfect segue into increasing the treatment role of criminal justice system, not just with medications. Six, um, provide a robust and comprehensive treatment and recovering continuum of care. Frequently, there's a focus on just the treatment, uh, uh, acute treatment part of the continuum. We need to look at the whole continuum, from prevention all the way through to supporting um, recovery. Seven, um, talked about rural isolation, um, using technology as a cost-effective way to deliver services to underserved um, areas, um, whether it's through telemedicine or the digital um, apps to address uh, some of these gaps. Um, eight, uh, to support the distribution of naloxone and other harm reduction strategies. Naloxone has been widely used here, it's been, uh, uh, it's been amazing um, what it's done with um, overdose deaths. Nine, um, provide funding uh, that is sustainable for the entire continuum of care. Too often we have the seed funding from the foundations, which we are very grateful for and it's terrific, but what happens afterwards to see that some of this is con uh, continued? Um, and 10, the need to address upstream factors related to opioid use disorders. I would call these some of the social determinant um, kinds of issues. These are key in, um, in, in, in solving um, the crisis. So it's taking to a comprehensive, whole person um, approach to this um, 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 issue. Next. This is um, my final slide, um, and we've used the term unique a lot in this presentation. There truly are unique challenges in Western Mass. We hope that we've highlighted some of them. We hope to hear from you um, in more in talking about it. But um, I think that what is widely recognized here, and we've recognized, is the unique opportunity that Western Mass has taken to come together to solve this problem. So kudos to you for all that um, you've been doing. This has involved communities, leaders in communities, the healthcare system, other um, systems, criminal justice system, other organizations the task forces and coalitions, and lastly, but not least, us academics to pull the research together and, um, and look at what's evidence-based. Um, we at Brandeis have, have been honored to do this work, um, and I have to say, I've been director of um, the Institute for Behavioral Health for <clears throat> longer than I'd like to say, um, and I have never been so impressed with the passion, the dedication, and the commitment of the folks in Western Mass to this issue. It is truly amazing what you're putting in in terms of PESO. Where's um, Dr. It's the human potential is, has, you know, just has come, come through and, and loud and clear in solving this problem. So um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Connie and Rob for a wonderful uh, report and um, certainly comprehensive and really captures a lot of the issues that we face. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, so as you heard, I'm Dr. Peter Friedman. I'm the Chief Research Officer at Bay State Health um, and um, Associate Dean for Research at the uh, regional campus of UMass Medical School, Bay State. 
Um, you know, I've been in this field for about 25 years, and I think if you told me I'd be speaking to such an august group like this about this issue when I'd started out, I, I, I would have been a little in, uh, incredulous that, you know, that things have really changed dramatically as a result of this epidemic, um, uh, I, I think is readily apparent. Um, uh, not just in my professional life, but really uh, across healthcare. And the thing for me that you know was initially appealing about uh, this, the family of disorders around addiction, uh, it still holds true, and we sort of see it playing out here. It's really the confluence of the clinical characteristics of the neurobehavioral disorder, and it really is a neurobehavioral disorder. Folks will debate, you know, what the meaning of a disease is versus a risk factor, and when does it become a disease? But it clearly is a neurobehavioral disorder, um, you know, that affects uh, the reward pathways, it affects cognition, executive functioning, um, and clearly behavior. Um, and it's the confluence of those factors with the social and economic and, yes, political factors that really makes this interesting to me and that uh, gives this epidemic its particular character. So it is, an, and it is an epidemic, we talk about a crisis, but it really is an epidemic both in terms of the proportions, um, but also in terms of thinking about the disorder, how it is passed, there clearly is a vector, right? So the vector, in order to catch the disease, one uh, is exposed to it. In this case, it's exposure to opioids. And um, we had a situation, as uh, has been widely reported, where there was a push to increase prescribing for, I think, for, for well-intentioned purposes, right? People with pain disorders seeking care. Um, I think this is uh, partly uh, also a function of our overstressed primary care system. So uh, my, my profession, uh, physicians, bears some of the responsibility and burden for this. Um, you know, we're very busy. We have 15-minute slots. People come in with complex pain issues. And it's a lot easier to just write a script than it is to explain to somebody you know, how to do biofeedback or where to go for, or, you know, to do all of these other things or why an opioid may not be appropriate. Um, I want to add to that also, um, you know, the amount of stress and anxiety in our society. It's become more and more fast-paced. More and more benzodiazepines um, uh, have been prescribed. That was not really discussed in, in, in the issue brief, but that is a f major factor in the overdose crisis. It really is the mixture um, uh, that really led to the initial uh, initial increases in deaths. Um, and then the other part, uh, which is fascinating, is sort of the growth in heroin markets outside of urban areas. Um, so, you know, like any entrepreneur is always looking for new markets. Um, and that sort of accounted for, you know, the first phase. And then, you know, in the, in the current phase we're in now, the advent of fentanyl, uh, as we saw in, in uh, some of Rob's slides, sort of poured gasoline on the fire, right? Um, so already the illicit supply was erratic, and this made it even more erratic. Uh, and we had the case of these folks at the same time, these folks who had pain conditions, many of them, um, who then became, uh, you know, tr transitioned over to having this neurobehavioral disorder, and their docs were telling them, no, I can't prescribe. And we've seen, you know, declines in prescribing. And then, but, but declines in prescribing, but not, we've not been aggressive enough in terms of offering other effective solutions for people. So we don't have, you know, comprehensive pain management clinics. We don't, you know, we don't have um, other approaches and, we didn't have a lot of providers who were all, uh, talking to people about addiction, knowledgeable about addiction. You know, when I was in medical school, I didn't really learn very much about it. Uh, I, in many ways, I'm kind of self-taught, as are many of us in the field. Um, 
And so docs didn't know how to talk about this. And so they would um, summarily decrease folks. Uh, I recent, I, I'm one of the journal editors for the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment. We recently reviewed a paper from Vermont, which is not too far from here, looking at you know the tapering courses of folks who are discontinued from opioids, and the median amount of time for a taper was one month. You know, so you know people are being cut off pretty precipitously. We hear cases across the country of suicides from people who are cut off from their pain meds. So clearly the pendulum has swung in a direction where we, we are no longer prescribing as well. Uh, uh, we shouldn't, be given, given all the issues, but we need to think about what are we offering people. And, um, and, and we have to ask the question, as we stop prescribing, where are our patients going to go? What are they going to do? to get relief? What are they going to do to deal with the withdrawal issues? Um, and the other psychosocial issues that come with this disorder. And I think we as physicians need to think about that. We as providers uh, need to think about that. Um, in, in addition, you know, the stigma talking about it really makes it challenging. People don't want to, you know, to give, give someone that label is a very difficult thing to talk about medication treatment as a chronic, in many cases, lifelong thing that people are going to need. Um, uh, a lot of folks don't want to hear about that. And, and um, we have further issues out here in the West. We have methadone. We actually do pretty well in terms of buprenorphine access, but we have methadone deserts. Um, and the, but the treatment really is stigmatized. People are encouraged to come off prematurely, and that really is a major issue. Also, in our smaller communities, it's hard to maintain anonymity. People don't want to come forward because, you know, the person sitting at the front desk could be somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, right? So, so there are a lot of these uh, structural factors. The, the other thing I want to just say that's not really talked a lot about in the report um, is sort of the other sequelae. So clearly the, the, the effect on maternal child health is really important. We have a concomitant epidemic of hepatitis C that's, that, is, that is raging as a result of injection. And um, all, many of those folks are going to require treatment. So we need to think about how we expand access uh, to that as well. Um, so the other part of the report that I thought was what very well said is that really the the structural issues, as I mentioned, that make make this interesting for me in terms of the meeting of the neurobehavioral disorder with these social and political factors. Those structural factors are are remediable, right? But um, it requires political will. It requires financing. Um, it requires a change in priorities. And that has been part of the issue, I think, uh, in thinking about this. Um, and it requires changes in behavior. Charge, it requires not just uh, writ large, but each of us individually as prescribers, as clinicians, in terms of how we address folks uh, who have these problems. Um, so. You know, we can go down the list of them, you know, transportation to treatment. How, how do we think about making that available? How do we increase accessibility of medication treatment? And how do we decrease the stigmatization of medication treatment for this disorder? You know, I think a lot of folks um, still believe that, you know, methadone or buprenorphine is replacing one addiction for another. And if you have a true understanding of this neurobehavioral disorder, that nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about that individually if anybody is interested in that. But that really contributes um, uh, to the stigma. Uh, the high rates, you know, rates of prescribing have come down to about 2015 uh, uh, rates, but we still have uh, fairly high rates of prescribing because it's difficult to find time to talk with folks about these issues. And I just want to close 
uh, in saying, though, that uh, as the report mentioned, we have reasons for optimism here in the West. Um, we have very strong community coalitions. They're very much engaged in a large-scale research project that's coming out of Boston Medical Center and uh, from NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse, that we are involved with uh, called the Healing Community Study. So a number of our communities um, will be involved in this project. And really, the question that the Healing Community Study is asking is, if we take these best practices providing medication, providing naloxone, treating folks in transition from jail, um, uh, you know, dealing with these structural issues. Can we reduce the overdose rates? The goal is ambitious to reduce overdose rates 40% in three years, um, but that's gonna be starting, uh, the randomization actually occurs in October, so coming up, and we're gonna start to see, it's across, it, it's our state and uh, New York, Ohio, and Kentucky, and we'll really get some answers about whether these things that we believe, we hypothesize they work, and there is smaller scale work that suggests that they work, um, but we're really going to start to see. The other thing that's really exciting is our jails are doing more in terms of providing medication treatment uh, to inmates. We are involved with the Justice Community's Opioid uh, 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 Initiative, which um, is studying a very innovative um, uh, legislative mandate here in Massachusetts where seven jails, including three here in the West, were mandated to provide all three of the FDA-approved medications for opioid disorder um, for folks who are on them when they come in, but also in transition back to the community. And I really believe we're going to show dramatic improvements in terms of the risk of overdose. We heard that folks leaving jail and prison have 130 times the risk of overdose as others, largely because of the detoxification. So we have reason for optimism. Um, we have uh, new harm reduction services in, in many of our larger cities. Um, so I just want to end by thanking all of you for your hard work um, in addressing this crisis. Uh, we still have a long way to go, but I think uh, uh, we've really made tremendous progress, and I'm, I'm grateful for all your efforts. Thank you. Uh, my name is Liz Evans. I'm an assistant professor here at UMass Amherst, and um, I, w I know I'm between you and our break, so I uh, will share a little bit about what I want to say in, in response to the report, and then I very much welcome uh, the discussion that we plan to have uh, in the afternoon or later. Um, so I did want to share a little bit about myself, you know, how I got into this type of work. How did I become a researcher? So years ago, as an undergrad in San Diego, I paid for school by working in the jails at night. So my job was to interview people. I was a research assistant. And as people were arrested and booked, I sat with them for 30 minutes, an hour, collecting information about their health and welfare and um, really kind of hearing their stories. And it was sort of through that process of talking to hundreds of men, women, and juveniles um, that I learned a lot about the nature of addiction that I had not really ever been exposed to before. And um, this was during the 1990s, during the war on drugs. Uh, so I heard a lot of stories from people about the trauma they'd experienced, um, how they came from families and communities where substance use was sort of typical, normalized. It was the way they were using to cope with um, adversities in their life. Um, and I kind of saw by talking to people that they really weren't that different from me. They had just been arrested and incarcerated, but were really all that different. And I kind of saw how they were not the enemy. They were the people who we had to figure out how to better help in some way. And I started questioning, is, it, is the criminal justice system the best way to resolve this problem? Remember, this was during the time of the war on drugs. People typically were not offered treatment in those settings. Um, and I would tend to see the same people come in and out of the jail. I was there most nights. So I'd see the same people again and again, week after week. Um, so I started questioning, can we really incarcerate our way out of this problem? 
At that time, though, I myself was only 19, 20, 21 years old, pretty young. I wasn't yet ready to launch research that could actually investigate solutions or alternatives to uh, the situation. Um, and I actually went off, did other things. Years later, though, I landed a job at UCLA in a major addiction research shop there. And um, just a side note, how did I get that job? It was really because of the work that I did as an undergrad. So we're here on a university campus. I just want to take a moment to say, if you're a student, how you spend your time as a student really matters. Uh, you could end up calling upon that experience in ways that you don't expect later in life to put it to a purpose that you don't really understand until maybe later. So I encourage the students especially, yes, go to class, take the test, do what you need to do to progress towards your degree, but also get involved. Go out into the world to make a difference in some way about something that you care about. Many of the people here today want to work with you in some way and help to school up the next generation of problem solvers. So during my time at UCLA, I was there for 17 years. I was a project director where I worked on a huge portfolio of work, more than 30 or so studies of addiction. And I didn't understand until maybe my first year or two that these were very special studies in that uh, we were doing longitudinal and prospective cohort studies. So that's just a fancy academic way of saying, you know, we were recruiting people usually from either prisons or jails or treatment settings or maybe community clinics. We would recruit people who had addiction and then we would follow them forward in time, interviewing them. Um, over time, also acquiring their records to understand what, what sorts of service systems were they encountering. Um, but by interviewing them, I mean that we were talking to them not just every month or every year, but every five years, 10 years, 30 some years. So by studying people over their life course, we could really track the nature of addiction, what happens to people over time. And um, I wanted to share a few lessons learned from that body of work, and it connects to the report. Um, one thing we, we found, and it really resonates with what we kind of accept today, um, is you know, addiction is a chronic health condition. What does that mean? Well, people often spend, spend many years of their life caught up in addiction using the substance. There are cycles of abstinence and, and return to use. Um, and it's a very cyclical type of health condition. So the work that I was a part of helped to provide empirical evidence to document the nature of the condition, such that maybe now more of us do endorse the idea that it is a chronic health condition that is challenging to address. Um, also, we were able to look at the different types of addiction, so opioid use disorders versus methamphetamine or alcohol or let's say marijuana. And it really stands out, as many of you, I'm sure all of you know, opioid use is especially lethal and especially persistent compared to those other substances. Um, people don't mature out of use. It's not as if they age and sort of slough off the use of that substance. No, they tend to continue to engage in it over time and they die out, they don't mature out. So these premature deaths are common occurrences that are avoidable. Um, but all is not last. When we study people over time, we also see that people do manage to achieve recovery. Recovery is possible. Um, and we became very interested in, well, how do people achieve recovery, especially lasting recovery. So what do I mean by that? I mean, they could stay in recovery for five or more years of their life, is how we ultimately defined it for our research purposes. And we could argue whether that's appropriate or not. Um, so, and then we became interested in, well, what then predicts or is associated with that lasting recovery? Um, it turns out, well, treatment with the medications is a very critical turning point event. So if people stay engaged with treatment, with medications, um, it lowers their risk of continued use and of course death, but also um, results in many other positive health and social um, improvements. Um, but that medication is effective only for so long as people continue to take it. It's not a cure. It's not as if someone can take that medication and they'll be done with treatment. They need to continue to engage in it as is consistent with a chronic health condition. Um, the longer people stay engaged with that treatment, the better they tend to do. Um, but it isn't all just about the medication. 
treatment. Um, there are other factors related to lasting recovery. So we saw from our research that um, those who had lower psychological distress were more likely to achieve lasting recovery. So what does that mean? Well, that's really, we're talking about co-occurring mental health disorders like depression and anxiety and other health conditions. Those are very prevalent among this population and it's something that needs to be addressed in addition to the addiction. Also, those who have more social support for entering treatment and staying in recovery, they're more likely to engage in that and feel able to um, stay in recovery. And yet, they're often living in communities where they do face so much stigma, like we saw from the report. Um, not just from family and community, but also healthcare providers. So that's a major area to focus on. How do we change the narrative such that uh, receipt of the medication is seen as a thing we want people to do. It's a positive thing for them to engage in treatment. It should be something that's easy and encouraged to do. Another thing related to um, lasting recovery was when people could be employed or find another way to have a meaningful contribution that they could give back to society in some way. So if you spent 10 or more years of your life engaged with addiction, you've really eroded your capacity to be employed. How can we work together to provide opportunities for for people to feel they have a way to give back despite their history of addiction. And then lastly, we also found that um, people who could be abstinent for five or more years were more likely to remain abstinent for the next 10 years or so. And it's this idea of, well, maybe people do need lasting treatment engagement. Um, it might be a lifelong type of uh, treatment engagement, not a one time or several months type of engagement with treatment. So I came to UMass to do something with all of this knowledge. I had done that type of work at UCLA for 17 years. Part of the reason why I came here was because of the nature of the opioid epidemic in Western Mass. I felt like I could bring my research to bear um, to make a difference, but I needed help. And I reached out to Risa, who you met earlier today, and she introduced me to Jennifer Kimball, who introduced me to Sherry Sullivan, Ruth Poti, Peter Friedman, so many people. And it's just to illuminate how we need um, like all hands on deck. So I'm excited to be here today to figure out how can we all work together to resolve the epidemic. Thank you. Um, we have some very interesting questions for the panel. And I've tried to organize them a little bit because I've seen a number of themes. But I will read this comment followed by two questions that are related. One comment is that um, someone said, at what point will we stop calling it an opioid crisis and view the substance abuse epidemic as a whole? So a new substance doesn't slide into the void. A very valid point. So moving on to the questions, uh, this person wrote, I understand the research team has parsed the data and created 10 recommendations. What I'm wondering about is, whether the panel could share their thoughts on prevention. What are some ideas that you have? And also, what are your thoughts around the overdose prevention sites? Any one of you can comment on that. Parts of question. One is about prevention. So, so, so the notion of primary prevention, I think, is really key. Um, so uh, working with parents um, uh, and you know, educating children about, you know, the, even though the prescriptions are prescribed and for their appropriate use, they, well, they have a, a window of safety, right? They, uh, they clearly have uh, issues around addiction that I think, particularly in the 90s and before, we didn't really appreciate the extent of which. Um, so talking, clearly education is a major part of it. I think, um, uh, Doing more around disposal is important, you know, so if anybody has opioids in your medicine cabinet uh, or benzos for that matter, if you're not, act, you know, taking an active course of it, uh, they really should be disposed of properly, either at one of the buyback sites or um, mixed with coffee grounds and disposed of, crushed up. Uh, you know, I, I, they say not to flush them. But if you have no other choice, it's better than having them present. Um, clearly, that 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 has been a big a big part of this. Um, and then the other part of the question was about overdose prevention sites. So uh, now I'm putting on my Massachusetts Society of Addiction Medicine hat. 
Um, and we have come out in favor of developing uh, overdose prevention sites. The legislature has said that they, you know, there, there have been a number of bills and that they would pass a bill if a uh, municipality would come forward being willing to do it. Um, and one has, the town of Somerville. So it'll be a very interesting year to see how that progresses. There will be some advocacy work going on in October to try to make that, uh, you know, push that forward. Uh, I do think the evidence is, is pretty clear that for communities that have these sites, they do a lot uh, in terms of reducing uh, overdose deaths clearly, but also infectious complications, abscesses, and also needle litter, which is a big issue uh, for a lot of our communities. Um, there are legal hurdles. Uh, I think the, the U.S. attorney in, in our state has said that he would prosecute. Um, but, you know, it's not the first time that um, there has been states' rights issues mm -hmm. around these kinds of things. There, are, um, there is a legal formula to try to make this work. So, um, so I think it is something that uh, eventually we will see in this country, as you know, they are uh, present, in present in Canada and around uh, other countries around the world and have been highly effective in preventing deaths. Um, so we'll see. Thank you. Dr. Horgan. Thank you. Okay. The term um, crisis, um, that does seem to indicate that this is something that short term we can just go in, zoom in and fix it and it's going to be over. That's not true. Maybe we should start using other language. Opioids are part of looking at the whole um, problem. Um, it's going, the problem specifically related to opioids will be long lasting, but there are other issues and you have to look at everything together. I just like to use two examples. Um, Peter uh, mentioned when you're thinking about the crisis, look at what other things it involves. We've, talk, we've uh, talked about the hepatitis C, other aspects. There are other intersections with um, medical issues that are key and is, is part of looking at the whole package. Um, the other issue is when we think about opioids, shouldn't think about it in a silo. silo. Um, most people who are using opioids are also using other substances. And uh, uh, we've mentioned um, benzos, which is certainly a huge issue. But please, let's not forget about alcohol. Um, and most um, people are um, using both alcohol and opioids, and alcohol is a problem in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So let's start looking at the broader things and thinking of things more um, more uh, comprehensively. Just on the prevention approach, I am going to turn it back over to um, uh, to Rob um, to talk about the um, more about prevention in the report. But um, the um, prevention, Peter, you very uh, uh, rightly uh, pointed out the problem of what about people who have a problem and are experiencing incredible problems because of the greater difficulty in obtaining, uh, obtaining opioids. And that is a huge issue. And this, this is a chronic problem and we need to deal with it. But we also need to focus on prevention in terms of prevention stopping the problem in the, in, in the first part. So prevention is key to have it not happen in the first place, but we have to clean up our mess also. Mm -hmm. So what are we gonna do about it? And that's important. Rob, you'll have the last word on this topic. What? Okay, uh, I'll be very Sorry. brief. So uh, I appreciate whoever posed that question. They've obviously done their research by referring to uh, overdose prevention sites and using that type of language. It's very, very interesting that they recently did a study uh, and they either called them overdose prevention sites or safe injection facilities. And I think 40% of people supported the overdose prevention sites, but only 20% supported the safe injection facilities. They're the same exact thing. And I think <laughs> what, it, what it really highlights here is how important language is uh, mm -hmm. and how we we talk about substance use disorder. Uh, there's also uh, the studies looking at calling people substance abusers versus a person with a substance use disorder uh, and using language like referring to people as addicts. 
Uh, this is all stuff that increases stigma, and so we really need to look at uh, our language, both in the general population and how we speak, uh, but also uh, definitely also uh, in, in the medical and psychosocial spaces as well. Um, you know, in, in echoing the polysubstance use problem that we have, a, a study that, that actually came out of Boston Medical Center uh, showed that over 80% of the opioid overdose deaths, there's also another substance present other than opioids. Uh, so that really highlights that this is a polysubstance uh, epidemic. And uh, we've been seeing a, a, a large increase in the use of stimulants, particularly methamphetamine, and there's actually been talk about uh, this fourth wave um, that could be happening uh, with, with the increase in methamphetamine. And, and I think something that's very important is that all of this money uh, that is coming in, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, we need more of it to address the opioid crisis, but all the money that's coming in, we should be considering how can we build infrastructure that can support all substance use disorders, not just opioid use disorders. Thank you. Thank you. So speaking to infrastructure, um, this question comes from a family support specialist in Berkshire County who uh, says that um, her agency has access to her clients' um, cell phone numbers who also happen to be very socioeconomically um, challenged, um, but a cell phone is very important to them. So if we have access to databases that include information such as cell phone numbers and, very, and email addresses, why do we not use these as a way of engaging um, folks more directly? Technologies like that are ones that have happened just in the last 10 years, and so it does present amazing opportunities to create innovative uh, interventions or different ways of engaging with people. So we do use that technology now for our long-term follow-up studies. So it is a critical way that we stay in touch with people over time. We use the way that they prefer. So it often is their phone or texting or different ways through that um, technology. Um, also, others are embedding that into health interventions. So there are certain groups who specialize in using that technology to um, re-engage people with care, to stay in touch, to make them feel more connected. Um, so there are especially like cell phone apps that are all about how do we use an app to help people recognize stressors in their life and to recognize that and then you do something else besides using substances in response to that stress. So that's um, work that I've been engaged in in the past and I would be eager to talk with anyone who'd be interested in that type of work going forward. First has to do with the DEA, which has placed a moratorium on mobile methadone clinics. Do you have some thoughts on whether it's time to revisit this restriction? And also related, what are we doing about affordable, safe housing? These would help increase sober living options and that might be an opportunity for us. Uh, I think probably Dr. Boti may talk a little bit about this later. Um, uh, the, the regulations right now, um, especially uh, on methadone, um, in my opinion, are uh, inhibiting access to treatment that has been proven uh, to, to save lives. Um, and I know actually here uh, in Massachusetts uh, during the interview process and talking with BSAS, uh, there is a, uh, a, a funding proposal uh, moving forward on trying to identify these methadone deserts and, and to do something about them. I just, wanted, I just wanted to say something about methadone. And you're absolutely right that, you know, the methadone uh, rules were developed for a different epidemic, for, for a, a prior epidemic of heroin use, and at a time when we really didn't understand uh, the benefits of greater access. And we've seen internationally that um, uh, off, you know, office-based prescribing of methadone is effective. Uh, it's done in Britain, it's done in Australia, it's, and um, uh, we don't have that option available. So you're, you're um, so to be able to expand access, not just mobile clinics, but also for uh, uh, hopefully trained physicians to be able to prescribe this outside of a clinic setting uh, really would help uh, improve access. Um, the, the whole question of sober living is, is, a, is a really, really important one. So we have 
Uh, as we know, there is a, a strong association between substance use disorder and homelessness, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for certain populations, and housing is a huge issue in our, in our region and sober housing in particular. Um, uh, you know, that is really key in terms of uh, recovery. As a matter of fact, I, I, I did some work a number of years ago looking at uh, longitudinally at folks uh, who had completed treatment programs, and we were interested, I was interested in, you know, I'm a doc, so I was interested in things like how does medical care improve outcomes, mental health care. Really, the two things that, were, that we demonstrated that improved long-term outcomes one was housing assistance, mm -hmm. and the other was employment assistance. So those are the two things that uh, we really need to think about, um, how we make those things available. Uh, as you know, felony charges make it difficult to get to, often to get housing, and, and drug use uh, is very much associated with that. So there are a lot of structural issues like that that we need uh, to do more uh, in terms of addressing. Wonderful. Dr. I will Hogan. be very brief. Um, there are some very interesting experiments going on with how to better incorporate so payment for social determinants of health into the healthcare system. Um, some insurers have some model programs that are going on. So I think we're at the very beginning stages. There are um, innovations going on in housing. There's something going on with Medicaid in New York State experimentally. So stay tuned and be part of, um, of doing things in this area because it is a social determinant and it's important broadly beyond just opioids. This is something where you're looking at the whole person. So that's uh, There are a couple of questions, a couple of folks who are interested in your research into juvenile issues um, and there is also a concern with parents whose children are removed from their care due to opioid incidents. What are your thoughts on this? What are you seeing in terms of the research? What implications do you think it, had, it has here for us in Western Mass? Well, you know, in our research, we know that people with the condition, they are embedded in their families, and it's important to involve them as much as we can in their care. So families can be a great source of support for people who are seeking or already in recovery, but sometimes they might need a little education on how can they be supportive and helpful and not, you know, inadvertently undermine the uh, recovery process. So um, that's something I'm interested in, I'm working in that space now, um, to hear how people in recovery want their allies, the allies in their life, to work with them in partnership to help them stay engaged in treatment. And, and, and I'll just follow up on that by talking about a, a few of the innovative models um, that we discussed in detail in the issue brief. Uh, uh, that were sort of aimed at uh, dealing with the family issue, the intergenerational impact. And so the Franklin Family Drug Court, uh, which was the first uh, in the nation to, to really, really take a crack at looking at the entire family uh, and treating the entire family, uh, they have some really promising preliminary results uh, in being able to, to, to have a sort of take a life trajectory approach. And so uh, more and more research is coming out that trauma uh, is, is a huge factor uh, in the development of substance use disorder and that trajectory. Uh, and so uh, being able to take a life course approach, and, and, and if I remember correctly, I think that 100% of the children um, had experienced at least one adverse childhood event mm -hmm. um, in this program uh, where their parents were um, in, in substance use, uh, had substance use disorder. And, and another program was the Empower program uh, through Bay State Franklin. And they really looked at the power imbalance um, that can sometimes happen between uh, 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 parents that lose their children uh, and the Department of Children and Families. And they tried to, uh, you know, tailor their interventions to, to try to decrease uh, that power imbalance. Um, so so that, that's very important to, to have that context uh, when you're addressing family issues. So many, many, many thanks to our panelists. We really enjoyed your presentations and comments today.